From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. 2023 is not a big election year, but there are still some state and local elections of significance. And two of the most important are this spring and the coming weeks. On Tuesday, a handful of mayoral candidates square off in Chicago's primary, and incumbent Lori Lightfoot is in trouble. Further north in Wisconsin, an April 4 race to fill an open Supreme Court seat, state Supreme Court seat, gives Democrats a chance to reclaim a 4-3 majority for the first time since 2005, and the implications go well beyond the Badger State. Plus, the Republican National Committee says that to get on the debate stage in the next year in presidential debates, the candidates must promise to endorse the ultimate winner of the party nomination. Is that a good idea or a pipe dream? We'll tell you that. Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo with Kim Strassel and Colin Levy, the estimable ones. Let's start with the uh, Chicago mayor's race. Colin, you fated to live in Chicagoland. I guess it's a choice. I'm a former resident of Chicago, although many moons ago, back when it was a city that worked, Mayor Lightfoot is in third place in the polls now behind Paul Velas, former schools superintendent in the city, and Brandon Johnson, who's the Cook County Commissioner and is the favorite of the teachers' unions. There are some other folks in the race. So how much trouble is Mayor Lightfoot in? I think she's in real trouble, Paul, to be honest. Paul Velas now has taken a fairly significant lead, and she's really struggling to defend her tenure because... She's been in office now during some of the worst years that we've seen in Chicago. Obviously, crime is way up. The economy is kind of hinky here and there. You've seen a lot of major businesses leaving the city and leaving the state. And so she's struggling to figure out exactly what she's running on. Paul Vallis has said he's the guy who's going to put the cops back on the street and get law and order back. Brandon Johnson has said he's the guy for the teachers union who's going to throw everything to the public schools. So she's sort of trying to thread the needle and say, hey, look, it's almost like a, you know, you don't want to change horses in midstream kind of argument here. Even when you're drowning in the stream? I mean, even when when you're drowning in the stream. What's her case for re-election? It's it's so bad (laughs) it could be worse. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) I think, frankly, one of her cases in the primary has been she's the one who can beat Paul Vallis. There may be something to that. Of course, if it did end up in a final contest between Vallis and Lightfoot, we would have the very fun spectacle of watching the teachers unions have to support Lori Lightfoot. Uh, So that might be a a terrific (laughs) argument for why that would be a perfect outcome. Let me ask you a question there, Colin. Lightfoot says, I'm the one who can beat Vallis. I mean, what's the argument against him that they're using? He's somehow some right-wing invader in Chicago, which seems implausible. No, for sure. This is a guy who's always been a Democrat. But yes, that's what they're trying to say. They're trying to say, hey, this guy's the most conservative. He's sort of a wolf in sheep's clothing, that he has some different ideas about education and he's not going to just go lockstep with the unions. So I think that's what they're really fighting him on. You look at Brandon Johnson, the way they're trying to split up the electorate now. Brandon Johnson is definitely really trying to run to the left. He's trying to pick off voters, I think, to Lori Lightfoot's left. He had an interesting thing over the past weekend where he was standing with this guy named Nick Ward, who's a socialist aldermanic candidate. And Brandon Johnson came out and said, hey, you know, everyone's been giving me a hard time saying that I'm a socialist because I'm standing here with Nick Ward. He said, well, hold on a second. I actually need guys like Nick Ward to support me because we're about to pass a budget that's going to tax the rich. That's a direct quote. So I think that's the way the race is breaking down. Yeah, as if uh, Chicago doesn't already tax the rich. uh, (laughs) (laughs) And even the not-so-rich. Indeed. So the race, Kim, you have not, unlike Colin and myself, lived in Chicago, as far as I know. It's a lovely city. It really is. At least it was. And I think it's depressing as a former resident that a city that, you know, once was great has had so many problems. And, you know, they kind of ran Rahm Emanuel out of town uh, after two terms. And the Chicago Teachers Union is such a power in the city. Their contract is up in 2024. They kept the schools closed during the pandemic for much longer than the parents wanted. Wanted, and much longer even than Lori Lightfoot and the a formal school district wanted. So their contract's up in 24, and they obviously want Brandon Johnson 
to continue doing the same thing and writing them big checks, raising their pensions, raising their pay, but not putting any more burdens on them. Yeah, that's right. No, I've never lived in Chicago, although thanks to Colin, I've had many invitations to that city. So I have got to spend some time there. And yeah, it's been very sad to see what has happened. And I think that this is why you have an opening for someone like Paul Ballas. Remember, he actually ran four years ago and did terribly. Uh, I think he only got about 30,000 votes. He finished like ninth. But oh, how things change. And he strikes me as a little bit like a guy like Eric Adams, who ran in New York City. And you wouldn't have ever suggested that Eric Adams was some sort of a conservative. But by the simple fact that he was willing to talk about some reforms and was willing to back the police, things were bad enough in New York that voters paid attention. And this is what you've got happening now. I think people very much understand that Brandon Johnson is going to be a vote for, as you say, the teachers union's status quo. Lori Lightfoot is now, having run as an outsider four years ago, is now trying to suggest that somehow she's the seasoned hand. But people can look around and see what the seasoned hand has got them. And so in Ballas, you have this former public school executive who ran Chicago public schools. Prior to that, he also ran the school district in Philadelphia. So he knows a bit about education. He has suggested about investing more in charter schools. He wants to hire more policemen and also have them again start prosecuting, oh my gosh, misdemeanors. And I think if you are a Chicago resident, that kind of common sense approach, it's again, hardly a conservative platform, but more common sense in what's being offered from the other candidates who would just seem to be folks willing to bow to the usual special interests that run Chicago. That's why he's getting some note. Colin, this primary will pick the two finalists who will go through to the general in, I guess it's April 4. Who are you predicting uh, makes it through? It's a tough prediction. I think Vallis will make it through. Between Lori Lightfoot and Brandon Johnson uh, would be the next most likely. I think Chuy Garcia still has an outside chance to be in that final. But, you know, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on Kim's point about the real need in Chicago for just sort of common sense reform, especially on crime. I was reading this morning, there was an interesting poll out from Northwestern University that found that crime and the cost of living are the two most pressing issues on the minds of the city's African-American communities. And I think that's something that is going to come into play here, along with just the base turnout, which is going to be a big deal. But many of the neighborhoods on the south and west sides of Chicago are really very unsafe. And the families there are trying to raise children. They're concerned about the schools. They're increasingly concerned about the pervasive crime that spiraled out of control and that the city leadership hasn't seemed to be able to handle. So, of course, there's concerns about other issues, but I think this deep interest in reducing crime and providing more sort of programs that are going to keep children safe is going to be a big one. All right. Thank you both. We'll see what happens. Let's turn to this race for the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The mix now is four to three with Republican appointees controlling the narrow majority, but a Republican vote, one of the four, is retiring. So in Wisconsin, there's an election to replace her. And the uh, race for the primary occurred last week, and it was a four-person primary. And Emerging in the top spot is uh, Milwaukee County Judge Janet Protasiewicz, a Democrat. She led the primary with 46.5 percent of the vote, a very comfortable lead. And Republican Daniel Kelly finished second, but well back with only 24 percent, defeating Jennifer Darrow, who finished Republican with 22 percent. Democrats really sense an opportunity here, Kim, and uh, Protasiewicz uh, isn't hiding her ambitions and her agenda if she wins. And right now she's the favorite. Yeah, it's a very concerning because she's been pretty clear in broadcasting, which is unfortunate because we increasingly seem to have these judicial races that are almost proxies for, you know, the type of races we have in Congress. People are so open about how they're going to judge cases and prejudge cases in their bid for these slots. But she's been very blunt, for instance, on a abortion after the Supreme Court's decision returning abortion questions to the state. Wisconsin reverted to a statute it has on the books from 1849 that makes abortion a felony except for in cases where the mother's life is at stake. She's got an ad out in which she says, you know, I believe in a woman's freedom to make her own decision on abortion. So no question there how she's going to vote if that comes up to the court, even though this is something, by the way, that should be decided by the legislative branch and signed by a governor. I think you're going to 
see if she were to get into this. Democrats are very keen. We've seen this happening across the country to use the Supreme Court to engage in redistricting maps. Wisconsin, like other states following the census, had a number of controversial maps. The current Supreme Court did sign off on them, but Democrats remain very angry about them. And she has already come out and said that she believed that the maps that the court has already agreed to were rigged. So you can definitely see Democrats filing new litigation there if she were on the court hoping to get those maps thrown out. Those are just a few of the stakes at play here. And, you know, we can talk a little bit too. I think one problem here is the lead conservative justice who's running, Daniel Kelly, who you mentioned. Yes, he clearly split some of the vote with Jennifer Darrow, who was also a more conservative judge, but he has lost a retention race in the past in the state. And so Democrats see a real vulnerability there and are pouring money into this race in an attempt to win over the court. Yeah, Kelly, he was a justice appointed by Scott Walker in 2016, lost a retention race in 2020, which does not bode well for his prospects. I think Proda Seawitz will have more money. There's no question about it. Kelly is running against her on crime, saying that her record in Milwaukee County as a judge is soft on crime. But the race here, Colin, is interesting as well because it looks as if the abortion issue is cutting against Republicans again. The turnout in this race primary was extraordinarily high for a spring off-year primary. And a lot of Democrats seem very motivated by abortion because by an accident of history, the overturning of Roe v. Wade meant that the Wisconsin abortion law reverted the state law to an 1849 statute, that's even before I was born, that makes performing an abortion a felony except to save the uh, the mother's life. So that's obviously on the extreme end of the abortion restrictionist spectrum. And that, I think, is motivating Democratic voters here. I think it certainly is. And I think also, Paul, this is going to be a major turnout race, and it's going to be a major money race. I mean, some of the funds that are pouring into this race now, as you said, are just on track to break all records. We saw enormous money poured into the primary, and that's only going to get higher. I think the previous record in the country, I believe, comes out of a court race in Illinois, where I think there was $15 million spent on that race. And this one certainly looks like it's headed to surpass it probably easily. You know, I think the national money that's coming in has to do with these big issues and turning these state races, the state court races, into sort of high profile national style campaigns. You know, listening to Protose was talking, you could think just as easily that she might be running for, you know, Congress or, or running for governor. And I think I wanted to talk to a little bit about the fact that, as Kim mentioned, the discussion of the drawing of the maps and Protosewitz saying that anyone would see that these maps were somehow rigged. I think we need to be really explicit about what the maps are about. What you have here is that you want, national liberals want to be able to take control of state legislatures, right? So the Democrats are frustrated if they can't get control of a state legislature. There's all sorts of things that they can't do. So if they can just fight in one race, and get a friendly judge to overturn the maps and line things up the way they want, then they think that they have a chance to get more friendly lawmakers in. So I think that's something that is going to be really high in the minds of all of the outsiders who are pouring money into this race. (laughs) 